Hi, uh, welcome back. Um, on behalf of the Russell Sound Sage Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and Duke University, it's my pleasure to welcome you all back to the Summer Institute in Computational Social Science. And it's also my pleasure to welcome you all on the live stream. Uh, we're very excited for our guest speaker today. It is Sendel Malanathan. Um, he is, I believe, the only person to be a guest speaker at the Summer Institute in Behavioral Economics and the Summer Institute in Computational Social Science. And that tells you something about Sendel's work, the huge variety of topics he's worked on and always making very impressive contributions. The range of things he's worked on is incredible and so wide I can't remember it, so I'm just going to read it off for a second. Um, the impact of poverty on mental bandwidth, whether CEO pay is excessive, using fictitious resumes to measure discrimination, which is one of my favorite papers about Emily and Greg and Lakeisha and Jamal, um, showing that higher cigarette taxes make smokers happier, modeling how competition affects media bias, and a model of course thinking. So in addition to working on a variety of topics, he also is constantly changing and evolving his work, and his recent work on prediction has been incredibly influential to me. Uh, and I know that, uh, it, in fact, we are very lucky that this is what you're going to talk about today. So I want to briefly mention some of the themes we've talked about, about what is the role of prediction in social science? What is the role of prediction in policy? There are a number of debates around this. Some people are extremely excited. Some people are extremely scared. And I think a defining characteristic of Sendel's work in this area is that it is incredibly thoughtful. It is aware of both the opportunity and the complexity. And they have a recent paper um, on using, making predictions uh, about decisions about bail and the implications of this on decisions that judges could make. And I think they do a great job of illustrating all the issues that go beyond just simply making the predictions and how you evaluate those predictions in a way that's fair uh, and doesn't bias us to thinking that the algorithm is working better than we think it is. Um, so, it is my great pleasure to welcome Sendel, and let's uh, give him a warm welcome. All right, thank you. So <clears throat> I'll talk about uh, prediction in social science, uh, and I'll just I'll take questions just as you guys have them, and we can just just yell, yell them out, I guess. Or, um, so this is work with a, a lot of collaborators. Um, as Matt alluded to, I think I'm going to be touching on, on um, prediction. And in particular, uh, here's the thing I want to set up. I think machine learning is what I've been focused on. I want to talk about how it provides actually excellent tools for making predictions. But prediction has a bunch of problems. And I want to <clears throat> talk about three kinds of problems with prediction. Um, first problem one, uh, to make policy, we need causality. And uh, prediction models don't really give any causal assurances, so they're a pretty flimsy basis on which to make policy. Um, second, uh, look, these algorithms are just black boxes. And if we're really going to do science, we need to understand mechanisms. So what's the point of making these black box predictions? How is that going to further the advancement of science? Finally, predictions tend to perpetuate existing disadvantages. That's because models are trained on data. Data has historical disadvantage, and so we should just bake them all in. I think this is probably where if I were to talk about three, I don't know if you guys have others on your list, but I tried to hit the three major points about why people are uneasy with machine learning, machine learning applied for, for prediction purposes. OK. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm not going to give a talk, because obviously with all these problems, why, why proceed? Um, no, so I want to argue that, in fact, that's not true, that many important policy problems rely on prediction. I spent a lot of time on causation. And I am not against causal inference. We spent a lot of time running randomized control trials. I think causation is central. But at the same time, some important policy problems rely entirely on prediction. So I'll try to convince you of that. Second, the idea that algorithms are black boxes and therefore we can't learn mechanism from them, I think I'll argue is entirely wrong. That actually that we can reveal fundamental mechanisms of social behavior through predictive modeling. And it's a, I think it's, a, it's just a, an illusion about how we tend to apply them. And third, I'll, I'll argue that I don't think algorithms inherently perpetuate this advantage that suitably deployed, they can reduce this advantage and bias. And so I'm putting it in such stark terms because I actually think all these concerns are entirely legitimate. And I think they're reasonable to address. I think what they're not is that they're not concerns that are unovercomable. 
they are concerns that can be overcome. And in fact, with care, when you overcome them, each of them, it's kind of like being at the gym and you lift a heavy weight and it makes you stronger. I think pushing yourself through these concerns actually leads the work to be better and is why I think a lot of these weaknesses eventually do become strengths. So what I sort of set up was a little talk where I will try and talk you through each of these three things that now are crossed out thanks to my being too clever. Um, each of these three things and kind of give you an example of papers and theorems in each of those contexts to give you a sense of where my thinking on this comes from. Um, I've made a talk that's way too long, so uh, maybe let's just try a show of hands. I'm sorry we can't do this in the remote sites, but we'll assume that I have a statistically random sample. Uh, how many of you want to just vote for one? This isn't the US election. You can't vote multiple times. <laughs> just um, how many of you would like me to spend more time on the first one? OK, how many on the second one? How many on the third one? OK, so I'll go. Sounds like one gets very little. Oh, that's too bad. All right. Um, <laughs> It's all a trick. I only have number one, so I just wanted to, you to reveal. I just really wanted to, you to reveal how much you're going to dislike this talk. So, you know, normally my students don't like me. I just want to establish a situation where I also don't like them. So it's perfectly fair and <laughs> symmetric. And all right, here we go. So, so okay, I'll dive in. I'll I'll run fast through this part, and then we'll get more time for the latter parts. Okay, so it's 4:07. We got. So first, just so we get all on the first same page, uh, I just wanted to give a very, very brief five-minute overview on how I think about ML. Uh, and again, with a show of hands, if I were to say to you guys, my understanding of machine learning is Y hat versus beta hat, raise your hand if you're like, yes, that makes sense to me. <laughs> all right, fine. You covered that? So you basically just got rid of all my slides. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Where are you talking at next? <laughs> Just curious. There's no, no, re I'm not going to show up there an hour before. Actually, that'll make it much simpler for me. I will skip all this. I will just show you guys something. <laughs> uh, we can go back to this at the end. I will, I tried to give a sense of regularization and, and give you an intuition. I will give you maybe this intuition um, as to why it's y hat versus beta hat. Maybe, do you guys all have a good intuition for that or no? OK. So <clears throat> this is the goal of prediction. Form an f hat such that from some set f, the loss of the prediction f of x for x, that's supposed to be y. So loss of f of x comma y minimize that loss in expectation for a new data point. Does that make sense to everybody? That's all prediction is. So use the data point to pick a function that does well in a new, new data point. The goal of parameter estimation is not quite this but it's something like this. It's to build an estimator whose estimate of the chosen function in expectation equals the function. Now, I'm pointing this out because take OLS. You all know that OLS is blue. It's the best uh, linear unbiased estimator. OK. How is OLS implemented? Loss minimization. So it's very, very, very easy for you to imagine this is what OLS does. Loss minimization is not consistency. OLS happens to do loss minimization. OLS has no such goal. For example, what's the best linear estimate? What's the best linear predictor? It is not OLS. With a single variable predictor, the best predictor of y even with the linear model, with just one variable, is not the OLS prediction. Anyone want to tell me why that is? It's the, it's the loss minimizer. And your theorem that you have when you resort to OLS is that it's the best linear unbiased estimator. Amongst the set of estimators where you are forced to have the property that the coefficients are unbiased, yes, OLS is the best. But it is not the best linear predictor. If you're going to do a single linear prediction, you would not end up with OLS. Does anyone have an intuition why, even if you can't tell me why? Is this a 
So it turns out that, yeah, so one intuition you can have is if you have a prior, that's one easy way to see why O less isn't the best. Because if you have a prior, say, centered around zero, and you got 100 data points, and you estimate it even, let's not use a one variable O less, let's use a zero variable O less, so you're doing mean estimation. So I have a prior, I have a draw with 100, your best guess is not the mean in the sample. It's the average of the mean in your prior. So if you're a Bayesian, already off the bat, you would never just use the data. That's very clear. <clears throat> Any other reasons? You guys have run OLS regressions all kind of have experienced this. Yeah? You are weighing, you are weighing extreme outliers. That's one. How many of you run a, OK. How many of you reported an R squared in a paper from OLS? Reported that? OK. Did you report the R squared or the adjusted R squared? Both? What's this adjusted R squared business? What are you adjusting for? Hmm? Sorry? How many variables you have, but why do you even need to adjust for that? What I mean? What, what, what is an adjustment for? I mean, why not just report, I use this many variables? What is it you're adjusting for? So let's, uh, this is actually kind of funny. I've never done this with my students. It's fascinating. I should do this. It's, um, that's interesting. So here's what you're adjusting for. What do you guys know about machine learning? If, you ever, if I were to tell you, I blindly estimated a machine learning model in the training set, look how well it fits. What would you say to me? You're worried that your machine learning model is overfitting. But guess what OLS does? It overfits a lot. You know it overfits. That's why you have an adjusted R squared. The difference between your R squared and your adjusted R squared is an attempt to form an estimate of the fit of your model out of sample. But once you understand OLS is overfit, in sample, of course it can no longer be the best predictor. It's an overfit. So you should always shade back from OLS, whether you believe in Bayesian priors or not. By construction, it's in everything you've done. Here's some data we had on the American Housing Survey. The overfit is huge, actually. Here's the in-sample. This was about 90,000 data points, about 300 variables. In-sample, ordinarily, least squares, 47.3. Out of sample, about 41.7% are squares. So you can see the, in, and you can just, next time you run OLS regression, just read R squared, read adjusted R squareds. Okay, so what I'm trying to make clear for you, the activity of prediction is not a delegated activity where because I can't get coefficients that are meaningful, I'm going to do prediction. No, things that are good about for estimation are not good for prediction. Things that are good for prediction are not good for estimation. So I want to start by making it clear to you that the things that you have that are good for estimation don't work well for prediction. It is not just some nuanced thing. And you just go home and try and play with the two variable OLS predictor and see how badly it does. You can beat it, not with the machine learning model, but just by scaling the prediction back even a little bit. OK, so that's the overfit. Now let me tell you a little bit more. That's what I wanted just you guys to see. This goal, and why I think people get confused is because so many estimators we have end up doing loss minimization, but that is not what they're doing. So I got a little sidetracked there because I saw that, so I'll keep going. So now let's go to, I hope I've helped you at least get a glimmer of why great estimators are shitty predictors. Let me give you a sense of um, the reverse side of it, okay? So suppose I have two variables, x and w. Suppose the true model is AX plus E or BW plus E, one of those two, okay? And then suppose X and W covary a lot, okay? These are very related. <clears throat> now I run an OLS regression of AX plus BW. What would the standard errors look like for this? And suppose, any guesses? I guess they would be correlated, right? Uh, let's talk about, they would be correlated. Yeah, that's your, you've jumped a step, but let's, I'll do the in-between step a little bit. They'd be very, very big. 
you would actually have this funny feature where you'd be like, wait, I can't reject that A is 0 and I can't reject that B is 0. But they'd be correlated. Which I think you guys probably run a lot of OLS regressions. Where would you even see that correlation? You would actually never see that correlation. But it's actually there. OLS coefficients, when we estimate them and we estimate standard errors, what are you estimating? You're actually estimating an ellipse, and you're seeing the projection of that ellipse onto each axis. So what would happen in this case is you actually have a long, thin ellipse. The projection is big in both directions. It's correlated, because so it's an ellipse this way. So you know one of them matters, but you don't know which one. So the OLS regression in this case would produce something that looks like garbage. You might even falsely conclude nothing matters. A lot of you have run regressions where you ran y on x and w and said, look, nothing is significant. None of these variables matter. But if they're correlated, that's an entirely faulty conclusion. OK, why am I saying this? You all have heard of multicollinearity, and you know that collinearity is a problem for regressions. This is a form of weak collinearity. It's not collinearity, but these variables are related. So you might say, oh, I guess this is a problem for estimation. It is a problem for estimation when you want beta hats because you'd like to be able to distinguish this beta hat from this beta hat, and you can't. And the regression is not erring. It's telling you unflinchingly, hey, I can't differentiate a from 0, and I can't differentiate b from 0. So if you tried to do is a equal to b, you couldn't really do anything. How much of a problem is this, in this scenario, how much of a problem is this if I'm trying to predict y? Nothing, right? Nothing. That's the awesome part. Prediction doesn't care. It doesn't care about the covariances between two variables because it doesn't matter where the signal is coming from. It's signal for y hat. And that is at the heart of y hat versus beta hat. If you have two functions that are similar in output space, that is very good for prediction, very bad for estimation, parameter estimation. But that is also at the heart of why it is that when we deal with high dimensional problems with lots of variables or lots of interactions, we can do predictions, but we can't do estimations. And here's why. In high dimensional spaces, guess what's always going to show up? Two variables will always covary. In fact, many, many variables will always be covarying. So once you have anything high dimensional, meaning a lot of variables or a lot of, or you have a few variables with lots of functional form, like fragile families, I don't remember how many variables you guys have, but it's not like the k is bigger than n. Oh, so it's k is bigger than that. So 12,000 variables. But imagine we downsampled fragile families to have 100 variables. So in the American Housing Survey, we've got, I think, a couple of hundred variables and about 90,000 data points. So it's high dimensional, not in the sense of more variables and data points, but in the sense of, I think I've got this here. Go back. So I've got it. It's 142 variables. But it's high dimensional in the sense that once you start including interactions between all of these variables and more complex functional forms, now you're high dimensional again. It doesn't take much, actually. A decision tree of a modest depth built off of 142 variables is quickly high dimensional because it's 2 to the k. OK, so I'm saying that because this is, I'm trying to lead you up to understand the tension between y hat and beta hat is fundamental. It comes because we can do high dimensional prediction. If you've ever wondered, how do I manage to predict with 12,000 variables 2, 000, and 2,000 data points? This is why you're able to do it, because you don't need to worry about covariance on the right-hand side. But the price you pay for that is you get no meaningful coefficients. So to close this part off, I'll just tell you that this is the figure I hope you keep in the back of your mind. This isn't just a hypothetical thing I'm saying, the trade-off between y hat and beta hat. In the American Housing Survey, we predict prices of houses. We use these variables, 142. What do we do here? We, we run it on 10 different folds. So we cut the data into one tenth, and we form predictions. We ran a simple lasso in each fold. We did model selection to pick out, I don't remember, 20, 20 variables, maybe 30, no, more than that, maybe 40, 50 variables. We tuned it. And what I've shown here is in each fold, I've shown you 
the x-axis is a particular variable, and I've shown you with white if the variable wasn't chosen and black if the variable was chosen. Um, if you work in genetics, things like this should look familiar to you. This is my closest attempt to look like a scientist. I was hoping that when people just flip through my papers, they're like, oh, look, a real scientist. They don't actually look at what's there. But anyway, so these are like tenfold, and I've tried to put in black when a variable is chosen. So anyone who is tempted to say, oh, my model selected this variable, look at how arbitrary it is from fold to fold to fold. This variable was not chosen here, but was here, was here, was not here. Was not, and it's not like I pick that variable every time in talks. You can just pick any row. There are almost no variables that are always chosen or always not chosen. This is a sense in which the same data, kind of divided into 10, so they're identical, the same thing being estimated using some model selection procedure, some machine learning model, something super transparent like Lasso, where we know what variables are chosen, can produce very different cho choices all over. If you had variable data set five, you could imagine sitting there going, oh, look, this variable was chosen. Oh, look, this variable wasn't chosen. Look at what it means. It means nothing. <laughs> nothing. And you should not fool yourself into thinking, oh, that's because there are no standard errors on these coefficients. That's not what it is. Given everything I've said, please don't let me down, can you guys explain why I'm getting so much variance across these things? I shouldn't have started by saying, don't let me down. <laughs> I'll give you a clue. Predictive performance doesn't vary at all from fold to fold. Yeah? Yeah, these variables. And I just want to push on something you said. You, you're, it's exactly right. The variables are related to each other. No variable has a pairwise correlation with any other variable in this data set that's very big. So they're not. It's not like I picked some bizarre data set. I could do this with any data set you've ever worked with. Why? Because every social science data set, the variables have relations to each other. For example, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, square footage, number. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of variation in square footage left over from number of bedrooms and number of bathrooms, but they're also kind of related to each other. Lot size, neighborhood. So. What's happening is they're all correlated with each other in some complicated way. I could probably reform this very, if I ran a regression of this on all the other variables, I get a pretty good R squared, so I'm able to reconstruct this a little bit. So the signal that would have come from this variable, I could have gotten from this one, this one, that one, and that one. So now I've mushed them together. The variables are all just related to each other. So I can get the same signal out through a combination of different variables. Yeah? Oh, I'll repeat the questions if I, yeah, thanks. But you wouldn't try dimension reduction first? Uh, and um, you could, yeah. Yeah, you can definitely do dimensional reduction, yeah. Okay. The, but it doesn't buy you anything. That is, dimensional redu dimensionality reduction doesn't answer the question you want to answer, which is, um, is this signal coming from this variable or some other variable? And the reason it doesn't answer that question is that Let's go to the fragile families. If we want to do dimensionality reduction and we had 12,000 variables and we want to do a PCA using only 2,000 data points, wait, we have a problem again. So we're going to have to do high dimensional PCA. High dimensional PCA has exactly this problem all over again. There is simply no way around the fact that when you have a lot of variables and a few data points, you cannot adjudicate between covariances between all pairs of them. That is just a numerical statement. It isn't a statement. Like, you should know there's a problem because you know you can't run a regular regression because of this. You know the matrix isn't invertible. So there's no amount of econometric voodoo. That's why you shouldn't get thrown into like a, there's no amount of econometric voodoo that's going to solve this problem. There's only one thing that can solve this problem, an assumption that the true data generating process has certain properties. If you say, I'm going to assume all of these variables are truly IID and they have no covariance, great, then you're done. That would solve it. And weaker versions of that, but basically if you're willing to assume away this problem, it's solved. But there's no other way out of it. And that's why Y hat is not beta hat. That is, at a deep level, what you buy for looking at high dimensionality is good predictions. What you lose is the ability to adjudicate between covariances in your data. And in high dimensionality, there is always going to be covariances in your data. 
that's, it's a, a combinatorial fact because there's many, many more pairs of observation, uh, variables than there are data points. Any question about this? Because maybe this is more was just my throat clearing and why have beta happen? Since you guys talked about it, maybe it's helpful to see why the tension is not a, it's not a failure of anyone's imagination. It's not like there's someone out there who's going to be like, I've got it. I found a way to do high dimensional prediction and get coefficients. It's actually an impossibility result. It's just not possible. Uh, but any questions about this? All right, on that breezy note of it's impossible. So that's where I tend to derive beta hat, y hat. And now I'll come back to these three things. So let's talk about relying on prediction. So the first thing I want to do is talk about relying on prediction. And to do that, what I want to talk about is um, one simple trivial framework that I've built for myself, or we've built for ourselves, to understand this. And the way I arrive at this or think about it is I start by saying, one reason pol policy seems so much about causality is the question of, should I do a particular policy? X seems like a question of, what's the coefficient on X? Because what I'm saying is, I want to give a treatment. What's the coefficient on the treatment variable? But it's more than the coefficient. I want that coefficient to be causal. So if you look at the literature, you wouldn't even take an OLS estimate and say beta hat is unbiased. You'd say, well, maybe there are other confounds beyond the data set. We really need randomization. And that's because we think most policies are of the type, what happens with and without x? And to make sense of that, how can I make sense of the question, what happens with and without x, except to get the slope on x to understand the coefficient? OK. So to, so to make sense of this, I just want to kind of, um, uh, what will x do, what happens? So, what I want to do is I want to talk about two toy policy decisions. And then, Matt, you've seen this, unfortunately, but I'll start. Uh, you guys haven't, probably. So the first decision, and both of them involve weather, and uh, they involve rain in particular. So in one case, you're the head of a small country and um, the agriculture minister, and you're having trouble because you're having a big drought. And somebody comes to you and says, hey, I heard you're having trouble with your drought. I would like to uh, do a rain dance to help you out. And you're wondering, is this rain dance business worth it? OK, so your policy decision is hire this rain dance expert. I don't know if any of you have seen uh, Chris do a rain dance, but it is extremely effective. But you want to test my hypothesis. The second is you're uh, the finance minister of that country, and you're going to work that morning, and you're walking into work, and you look up at the clouds, and you wonder, huh. Is it going to rain today? Should I take an umbrella? So your question is, should I take an umbrella to work? Both are policy decisions. Take an umbrella, hire a rain dance expert. Both are decisions where there are payoffs. If you take an umbrella when you shouldn't, you have to carry the stupid thing around. Uh, if, you take an umbrella when, if you don't take an umbrella when you should, you get wet. Uh, similarly, you can see it. Both have data of the following type. You could be brought in to one of these exciting projects. I think you guys said that I should give potential projects for students to work on. I think both of these are pretty exciting projects. So I would encourage you. I can get you data on this, too. So the data sets are similar. There's a y is rain. The x is a set of variables correlated with rain. And in both of them, you're trying to use some estimate of the function f of x to inform those decisions. But I hope it's clear is that one of these is entirely about causation, the rain dance. The other is entirely about prediction. So what's the difference between both of these? Because it's not like people will tend to say to you, oh, you know, if we're making decisions, we need causation. But the umbrella decision is a decision. So something is missing. We can't just have these trite views that like causality is the thing that's needed for decision making. And in fact, if you think about it, you all use predictive models, importantly, for decision making in your day-to-day -day life all the time. If you've ever taken Waze, or if you've used Waze, or taken an Uber that's used Waze, you've used a model that is predictive of the level of traffic flow at a particular point in time to decide which route you should take. So you've engaged in some of this. So what's the difference? So I'll give you a simple graphical model that helped me make sense of the difference. So the simple graphical model is the world has x's, y's, and payoffs. Everything is causal. So even though I'm going to apply a predictive model, my world is fully causal. X affects Y, has payoffs. X is the input, Y is the outcome, Pi is the payoffs. 
Now you're going to make a decision in this framework. The decision x0 is the thing we're trying to inform by looking at the data frame that has x, y in the payoffs. Does that make sense to everybody? Now let's just do this with rain, atmospheric conditions, and rain dance. The question I want to ask you is in this graphical model, where should x0 draw the line to? What is the arrow that, the, the arrow that you're interested in? The arrow between x0 and y? Exactly. This is the arrow of interest. We're interested in will rain dance influence y. OK, let's try this again. That's, that's a causal world. So let's try making x0 the umbrella. Where should I draw the line from the umbrella? Yeah. As tempted as you are to think you should draw from umbrella to rain, based on your past experience of somehow magically seeming to never be with an umbrella when it rains and never have it rain when you have your umbrella, it is not the case that there's an arrow from umbrella to rain. There's an arrow from umbrella to payoffs. Your payoffs depend on your possession of the umbrella, and that possession depends on whether it rained or not. These two things are, in many ways, the simple way to understand the distinction between prediction and causation. Causation happens when the y variable, which is on our left-hand side, is the object of influence of the decision that we are going to inform. That's why we need the coefficient in an unbiased way on this thing. Prediction happens when the y variable that we're seeking to model is not directly influenced by it, but knowing that y variable influences a decision which then affects the payoff. Does that make sense to everybody? This distinction is, I think, helpful. Let me see if I can show you. So it's basically, where does the arrow go? I have a different um, formulation if you're not used to these graphical models. If you just took a total derivative of the payoff with respect to the decision, you can see there are two terms. There's the direct effect of the decision on payoffs, which depends on y. There's the indirect effect of the decision on y and y on payoffs. This first term is the prediction term. In order to know the effect of my decision on payoffs, I need to know the y. The second term is the causation term. In order to see the effect of the decision, I need to know its effect on my payoffs through y. All problems have some mix of these two, which tells you that both prediction and causation is actually really needed in most problems. But we tend to focus on one or the other. And there are problems that are pretty edge casey in one versus the other. Does that make sense to everybody? OK. That's y hat, beta hat. And that is the way I think about it. So here is a concrete policy problem. And then we'll try and run it through. And then I won't spend that much time, because I didn't want to spend too much time on this one, as uh, the popular vote suggests. Though if the last three years have taught me anything, it's, not, it's to not trust the, uh, the electoral system. But nevertheless, we'll go with it for today. And don't tell me, oh, the popular vote went correctly. Uh -huh. I can't believe that's the, uh, the fluke that you want to rest your hat on, that somehow if 52% of people had voted for Trump, you'd all be happy now. <laughs> um, so the policy problem in the US that I want to focus on is that each year, I've always wanted to do this, but I never do it. Uh, how, for how many of you is that a big, well, did you know there are about 12 million arrests made every year in the United States? You knew this? I didn't. You're a criminologist? So it's no surprise you knew this. How many of you who are not criminologists knew this fact? You did. It's crazy, isn't it? It's insane. Anyway, so the question I want to look at is, where do people wait for trial? It's a pretty high stake decision, because when you're jailed, the average jail spell is about two to three months. So that's crazy. This is not being jailed because you're guilty. These are not sentencing decisions. These are people simply deciding where they wait. Two to three months, if you conceptualize it, even for a second, you'll realize all the consequences of not having your job for two to three months. You're kind of screwed. OK. It's also consequential because there are about three quarters of a million people in jail in the US. And I think almost all of them are people waiting, which means roughly, I mean, it's a little bit of an overstatement, about one third of the US incarcerated population is just people waiting for trial. Are not, when people say there's a mass incarceration problem in the United States, there's at least as much a, a mass waiting for trial incarceration population in the US, which is 
quite large. Okay. The judge's problem when deciding whether to release or not is to realize that, well, when the defendant is out on bail, they can behave badly. They can simply fail to show up, or they could commit another crime while out on bail. So it's kind of flight risk and public safety risk. By law, in every state in the United States, their job, depending on the state, is to predict either flight risk, fail to appear, or both flight risk and public safety risk. So by law, what they're supposed to do is predict these two variables and release based on their forecasts of these two variables. So in this problem, we basically have 12 million Y hats being formed every year in the United States and people being ranked based on those Y hats and then being released based on that Y hat. So it is an umbrella problem writ large. The judge looks at the X, makes a forecast, what's your flight risk, makes that forecast and says, therefore I will put you in jail or therefore I won't. This is kind of an extreme problem, but it's also in, in many ways the closest to perfect for social policy that you're gonna get because it's just prediction. The, ca the causal effect of jail on flight risk is pretty well understood. We know that. What's unknown is your base rate flight risk, which is the Y that we're trying to predict. And I say it's a good example of prediction policy problem. You can, I'll skip this because you, know, you can see. I think you guys can work out the graphical model on your own. So what I want to do is I want to just say, you, you can go through the pipeline. You can sort of take the data, form a training set, do the five-fold cross-validation, tune it, get a predictor. And then in this predictor and a holdout, evaluate it. Okay? So this is a perfect use case. And this is the kind of data we have. I'll skip most of this. So let me not, let me not go through exactly how we did it. Um, since you guys want to go through this fast, I'll just skip this stuff. So, okay. So, first observation. Normally, when you predict these models, you tend to get an AUC, and you tend to say, oh, here's the AUC. Okay, we did our model, and uh, we have an AUC of 0 0.707. Good. Now what? Is that good, or is that bad? Should I be happy with that? How many of you think an AUC of 0 0.707 in predicting flight risk with this data set is good? Raise your hands. Don't hurt my feelings. Come on. Just raise it. Just, you'll be fine. Raise it. You'll be OK. Thank you. How many of you think it's bad? How many of you have no clue? So now what are we supposed to do? Exactly. Yeah, that's how I feel most of my days. Uh, now, now, what am I, now what am I supposed to do? I have a prediction policy problem. We've agreed it's a prediction policy problem. I went and formed the prediction. Great. Now what? Do I report AUC.707? The referee says, hey, thank Thanks for that number, but I didn't know quite what that means. Can you explain more what it means? And he said, oh, I looked it up. AUC is the difference and the average probability between. <laughs> so what now? So like, what should you do? Yeah. What are the judges doing as a baseline? Oh, yeah. So it would be nice to compare this AUC to the judges' AUC. That'd be cool. Uh, but unfortunately, they didn't give us their predictions. We only know whether they release people or not. So, oh. What was the label uh, The label, uh, let's see. Average base rate was probably flight risk was 11.5%, uh, something like that, 11.5. Then that's good. <laughs> okay, why am I belaboring this point? Oh, you, you have some, or you're just stretching. That's the worst when you're stretching and uh, people think you're asking. You don't observe uh, what happens to people who actually go to jail. Yeah, we have a bunch of problems. So let's, let's yeah, that's a great one. Let me, let me talk about, I'm going to get to that in just one second. What I want to just point out is that there is a huge ocean that is between forming the prediction on a data set and actually using it in a meaningful way to say something about the policy at hand. See, if you just opened up a good KDD paper, this is where things would stop, typically which is good, because for most applications in KDD, the predictive power is a thing that has a unit that has some sense. But we're not trying to do that. We're trying to say, can we improve decision making by using this? So as a first pass, what you need to do is to say, I'm not sure I care about AUC. I mean, I care. I'm sure I should report it. What I care is, and we're going to get to your point now, what I care is, 
if I were to form decisions using this tool, what social outcomes would follow? And then I would want to compare that to something else like the judge's decision making. So I can't compare the judge's predictions, I don't have them, but I have the judge's decisions and I want to compare it to a decision rule implied by my algorithm. So what would be a good, out, what would be a good way to, what would be a good decision rule or set of decision rules I could build off of this algorithm? How might you want to decide who to release if I gave you this algorithm? So was that only predicted once and zero, or it tells So it already tells you off the bat. You hope I built an algorithm that predicted probability. Because I predict an algorithm that built zeros and ones is a pretty useless algorithm at this point. So you can see how just knowing you're going to bake everything into a decision framework already implies a bunch of stuff as to how you should set things up. So good. I predicted probabilities, and now you guys see where we're headed. We should rank people by predicted probability of risk, release people with the, highest, with the lowest risk first, and then work my way up. And that gives me a set of, release, uh, a set of decision rules that at different jailing rates has a different set of people I would, I would jail or release. Does that make sense to everybody? OK, which now gets to your problem. The, the algorithm has said, hey, yeah, in the holdout set, if you tell me I can release 10%, these are the people I would release. If I can release 20, these are the people I'd release. So it's beautifully ranked your holdout set for you in order of release. And you're like, this is going to be great. All I have to do now is to calculate the jailing rates in the holdouts, not the jailing rates, the crime rates of the release people. You go to the holdout set and you say, oh, there's a little problem here. Some of the release people that the algorithm wants to release, the judge didn't release, and we have no idea what crimes they would commit. But that's really problematic. And that's where I want to kind of get to at this point. So I would say that this is the biggest problem. So I think you can do the other steps very mechanically. You can just say, I know I'm going to model the decision. I'm going to form the things. But this problem, which we sort of call the selective labels problem. Why? Because labels is a terminology in machine learning. Here, there are labels that are missing, but they are selectively missing. And it's worse than just missing not at random. So people sometimes talk about it's missing not at random. It's much, much worse than missing not at random. Because a lot of times what people say is, oh, it's selectively missing. Great. What I'll do is I'll impute values to those people. OK, so I will just say, here's the expectation. In some cases, that's very, very good. In this case, I wanted to argue it is entirely unfair. And here's the sense in which it's unfair. Judges see factors that we don't. So suppose young people have dots on their forehead. I don't know why that one is in there. I don't know why it's in there in a different font, but there it is. That's really bizarre. Um, and these dots are perfectly predictive. The judge is releasing only if they uh, don't have a dot. Okay? So in the, in the release sample, these young people who are released have no crime rates. The algorithm says young people have no crime rates. We go into the, the holdout set, and it's releasing all young people, including those with and without dots. And we say, well, the ones who had dots who were jailed, we're going to assume they're like everybody else, and they're, they're released. So we then falsely presume that when we release all young people, we'll do better than the judge. Why? Because we are assuming that the judge is acting like an idiot and randomizing. We are assuming that once the observables are conditioned on, all variation in release rates are just random. Imputation means, by construction, that conditional on the x's, the judges are flipping coins. But guess what? If you're willing to assume that, I don't need to go any further. Obviously, an algorithm would beat the judge. Because it means at high risk rates, they should stop flipping coins. And at low risk rates, they should stop flipping coins. They should just bias the coin in either direction and go 0, 1. You don't need anything. You're assuming randomization. How is assuming randomization by the judge conditional on observables? You're basically baking the deck. If you don't take seriously the idea that the judge has unobserved factors that could affect the crime rate, then you're not really running a horse race of whether your algorithm can beat the judge. You basically set it up so that they, of course, beat it. So what I want to point out is this problem is not unique. It arises in nearly all prediction policy problems. 
because predictions influence the decisions, and the decisions influence the labels that we see. That's not always true. If I was doing predictions of rain and umbrella taking, luckily I see the rain whether or not you took your umbrella. But, and it's not true for ways. I see the traffic irrespective of the route that you take. So it's not true of all. But take recommender systems. You can see this problem is inherent in every recommender system. Netflix has this selective labels problem because the people who chose to watch the movies are the ones who saw some signal that they liked the movie independent of their characteristics. Netflix doesn't care about this problem because it doesn't really matter. They're not comparing their recommender to a human recommendation. They just think it's a very cheap way to deploy recommendations to lots of people. They're not saying, is our recommender system better than a human who had read all the movie reviews, blah, blah, blah. But in social applications, this problem is serious and must somehow resolve. OK, does that make sense to everybody? So the thing I'm hoping to convince you of is in the predictive policy space, there are tons of such problems, but that solving them is not a machine learning task. It's a social science task. It's an econometrics task very similar to the kind of task that you guys have machinery for. Yeah. All right, but correct me if I'm wrong. It seems like it's not a machine learning problem. It seems that it's a data collection problem. Because if we have data, and if we're going to assume that this latent knowledge judges are using is data that we haven't collected yet, then with this new data complementing the data that we have, the machine learning model won't be randomizing anymore. Am I on the right wavelength? or? I might say it differently. Um, one way to go is to say, well, if the judge has an unfair advantage in data, maybe we should start trying to collect all the data the judge sees. It's not an unreasonable way to proceed, but in a way, what we've done now is we've taken a fairly simple task, get archival data on rap sheets of individuals over the last five years from a big city, predict crime risk, and see if we can improve the judge, which is a very doable task that any of you could do, and turn it into an impossible societal task, which is now let's see if we can collect every single possible variable that the judge deems, including how you look, their judgment, their, how would you even do that? So in a way, what I'm trying to say is there's, there's a deep problem. One is to enrich the x's. But you can imagine how wild and rich the x's are. So another way you could turn into a data collection problem is to say, hmm, it'd be nice if we could have labels for those release people. So maybe we can just convince a jurisdiction to release a bunch of people that we don't want, that we want. Again, that's really, really, really hard. You've taken a problem that's within scope for any of you to do and turned it into a problem of convince a jurisdiction to empty their jails just so we can figure out whether the algorithm is working. So while it'd be nice, and if any of you have nephews or aunts or uncles or cousins who might be able to do this for you, I, in fact, I, no, don't do that. What you need to do is to recognize, even in the heart of this type of machine learning prediction problem, you have a selection bias that is not too dissimilar from the kind of selection biases we're used to in causal inference. So the question is, can we solve this type of selection bias? And I think we can. I think we just need to use the same kind of cleverness that we use when addressing these randomization-like problems in other spaces. What do we tend to do? We tend to look for variation that produces randomness, some form of variation, and try and use that to our advantage. What I'm just going to, I'm going to sketch this so we don't spend too much time on this paper. But I'm going to build this from two insights, and I'll just sketch this briefly. You, I can show you the figure if you want. The first insight is that the problem is really one-sided, actually. This is not treatment control, where I need to randomize the experiment and give some people treatment, some people not control. You'll notice when I said it, the ideal pilot is release everybody. It is not release half the people at random so that we can see the causal effect of jail. As, as I've already, in my forthcoming paper, shown, I know what the causal effect of jail is. Don't steal that paper from me. It's going to be very impactful. That's the science paper I was telling you about. Yeah, it's really. Um, so the problem is one-sided. In one direction, we know the label, zero. In the other direction, we don't. So the problem is we need to release some people and see what happens. Second observation is that um, we, 
uh, let me skip to this side. Is it worth seeing how general selective labels is for you guys? You probably have a sense of this. So every time, I promise you this, every time you read an article in the newspaper and they say, algorithms are better than humans than X, unless it's a video game, in almost every task that you read, there's a real world deployment task. It's a selective labels problem. Algorithms are better at deciding who to hire. Oh, fascinating. How did they get the labels on productivity of the people who were unhired? Algorithms are better at admitting students. Oh, fascinating. How did they get the labels on the students who weren't admitted? Algorithms are better at deciding which patients to test. Oh, interesting. How did they get the, you see, you can just go on like this for a long time. In fact, should I just do that for the rest of the talk? <laughs> you can see I'm really worked up about this, so. So just next time you're reading something, just ask how did they get the labels on the people? And it's very, very basic. In the zero one cases, it's super obvious, okay? But in other cases, it's more subtle, but it's still very, very problematic. Algorithms are better at detecting cancer than um, uh, radiologists are. Oh, what does that mean? I guess we must have had some sort of pathological test, pathology test on some people versus on not others. Oh, wait, but that's selective labels. Okay. No, no, they told me they looked at eventual mortality. Say, oh, okay, okay, mortality we have for everybody. But wait, don't you treat the people who get cancer? So you're looking at mortality net of treatment? What are you even looking at now? What are you even predicting? So if selective labels isn't in your face, I don't have the label, then you should be even more worried because you have a more, a more washed down version of selective labels, which is treatment pollution. For the people where cancer was judged by the doctor, I have outcome net of treatment. Where the people who it wasn't, I have gross outcome. And now what am, I predict what am I even doing now? You see how it gets much, much worse. The zero one case is the good case, because at least you know the problem. In the treatment pollution case, it gets really problematic. So that's just saying there's no way around this, and this literature has to take it very seriously. OK. So let me tell you what I might do here. I'll skip all this, because this is not going to be interesting to you guys. Um, so as I said, the problem is one-sided. So to deal with the problem, I would ideally like an experiment that released more people. Um, but guess what? We have that experiment. People are somewhat randomly assigned to judges. And when they're randomly assigned to judges, some judges are more lenient than other judges. And so now we almost have that initial random assignment almost gives us the experiment we need to be able to do it. Now, I don't want to assume the judges are doing anything, like that they're perfect, or that they're doing anything different. But I do now have one data set with a release rate of 65% and one data set with a release rate of 75%. I should almost be able to do something. And here's what I can do. I can take the 75% release rate judge, and I can say, hmm, I can't just willy-nilly jail and release everybody I want, which is what I initially wanted to do in this data set. So I'm going to start with the release set. And I'm going to say, it's unfortunate that this stupid judge won't let me jail or release anybody in this remaining 25%. They've already done that. I can't do anything about it. But in the remaining 75%, I'm going to find the 10% riskiest and jail them. So now, I know what the effect of that rule is. Why? It's the crime rate in the remaining release set. So now I have a rule that I can evaluate. I can take the most lenient judge. I can just jail, 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 and work my way down and see what the crime rate is. Guess who I can compare that to? The less lenient judges, which allows me to form figures like this. I, you, can, you can ignore the fact that these are all together. Here's the most lenient judge. Here's what the crime rate would be if I went down at random from that judge. The second quintile of lenient judges, they produce this about an 8% reduction in detention rates and about a 12% drop in crime rates. If I jailed according to the algorithm, I get, oh sorry, eight. This is why I should not read. I should just read this to you. So uh, let me just read this correctly. The judges. So relative to the most lenient quintile, they jail 6.6% more people and reduce crime by 9.9%. The algorithm to achieve 
that change in crime rate, the 9.9%, only needs to jail 2.8% as many people. In other words, the two numbers to compare are the 2.8 and 6.6, .6, meaning the judge, to get this drop in crime, jailed 6.6 .6 people. The algorithm only needs to jail about 2.8 people. So if you can do the math, we jail much less than half as many people to accomplish the same level of crime. And as you walk your way down, you get about similar magnitudes everywhere, which shows the judge is ridiculously inefficient. The judge is basically very bad at prioritizing who the marginal cases are. Does that make sense to everybody? OK, I can go into greater detail on this, but this was more just so you got a sense. And now there's a lot of holes to close, which we won't deal with here. But most of the work is, wait, how do we know that these two groups of people are seeing the same distribution of cases? Let's show that it's as if random. How do we know that the unobservables aren't too different between these? So there's a bunch of holes you want to close, and you can close them. But by and large, this is what you would sort of build up to. And the final thing you would build up to from here is in ways that I won't go into, we do some imputation bounds on how big the unobservables can be based on that previous exercise. And from it, we can form graphs like this, where we can at least do a policy simulation and say if the unobservables are this bad, and these are somewhat worst case analysis, this is what the trade-off would be. And then the final part of the paper would be something like this, which is to say, look, um, the judge jails 73.7% .7 of the people achieves, uh, and achieves an 11.3% crime rate. You could achieve an 8.5% crime rate. Or you could get that so you can reduce crime by 25%, or you can reduce jail populations by 41%. So if we were to summarize the results, it's that the judges are ranking so badly that by re-ranking, you can reduce crime by a lot, or reduce jail populations by a lot, or do anything in between. I don't know what the preferences of society are. All I did was say, we're sitting here on this curve. Here's a curve. Everything in this region, Pareto dominates. You pick. Does this make sense to everybody? So the main thing I want you to take away is prediction can be used in policy like this, but it's clearly the kind of work you guys should be doing, which is it's not machine. The machine learning part is actually the less important part of this. It's fairly mechanical. The important part of this is the kind of tools that a lot of quantitative social science has, which is how do you deal with causal inference-like problems. And um, the, the potential gains are very, very high. I don't know of interventions that can reduce prison jail populations by 41% at no cost to crime. That's crazy. OK, any questions about this? Yeah. On the difference between the two judges? No, no, the algorithm was just trained on the full release set. So everything that we're doing here is not in the training phase. We just always use the same algorithm in the training phase. The key is, I, I would say in the machine learning literature, there's a lot of emphasis on training. Why? Because they've got very clear prediction targets they're chasing, improve AUC, find clever and clever ways of training. In all these problems, sure, better training always helps. The problem is in evaluating. How do we even know whether our algorithm did well? So all the tricks I'm using here are just in evaluating a fixed algorithm. It's in saying, how do I know that the algorithm beat the judge? And this is just different ways of bounding the unobservables to ensure that I'm giving a fair comparison between judge and algorithm. There's another question. Yeah. So I'm interested if you could speak a little bit to like the types of data that you were able to utilize. and that informed your model, um, both like from the judge decisions or the crime rate data? Yeah. So the key thing here is we had f eventual failure to appear and eventual crime while they're out on bail, if they committed any. For the right-hand side, we basically had um, the rap sheet, the physical rap sheet when they came in. And the seven. The 0.707 reflects the fact that given the variables we have, it's not like crime is that predictable. But what this reflects is given that data, we are at least predicting it much, much better than the judge. And this is kind of a general lesson that I've kind of found in a lot of these things. I'll show you a medical example next, is that if you leave out a lot of the sort of more soft variables, 
How did the person look? Were they smiling? Were they not? They seem very rich, but they actually seem to be the area for human bias. So leaving them out isn't that costly. They're very, very rich for describing the judge's bias. So the upside of this paper is we have a lot to say about how we can beat the judge. We have nothing to say about where the judge gets it wrong with the exception of one variable. That is, if we try to understand why is the judge doing so badly, we have a bunch of the paper where we try to predict the judge's behavior. And I think exactly because we don't have the soft variables, we don't do a great job of predicting it. But we do contrast the prediction of the judge's behavior with the prediction of outcomes. Not much differs, again, for that reason. One thing does differ, which is current charge bias. So the judge puts way too little weight, um, too much weight on the current charge. So if you have someone with a long history of failure to appear or anything else, but this time they're brought in for stealing a bicycle, the judge seems to in, in there innately focus on that. Does, that. does that answer your question? So does, uh, does the model take into account um, the judge uh, setting of the amount of bail and the defendant's uh, ability to pay? Because that's yeah. kind of a key step in whether yeah. a person go to jail or not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, here we're, making the, we're, giving, a judge, we're giving the judge an, an advantage just because we, didn't, we have the bail amount data, but it proved hard to model. So we're letting the judge set bail as they do. The algorithm, unfortunately, only chooses nothing or everything. And that's, here's why we did that. It's kind of a worst case analysis because the algorithm doesn't have a graded way of saying, OK, well, you're not that much risk. Let me put a number in there. Why didn't we let it do that? Because then we'd have another selective labels problem. Because then we'd have to model the entire elasticity or responsiveness of your. So here we just, it's almost like we're comparing a judge setting this continuous variable to a judge forced to set the endpoints, basically. OK, so uh, you said it's interesting to start looking at where the judge gets it wrong. I'm curious your thoughts on the case where the judge thinks the algorithm has gotten it wrong for a specific case. Like, let's say the algorithm gives a distribution of assignments, and there's a, a, a case where the judge thinks on the basis of some sort of narrative-based knowledge that this isn't the correct assignment. Yeah, so without question, all I've said here is not that the judge, the algorithm beats a judge on every instance, but that on average the gap is huge. But that doesn't mean that, in fact, it doesn't even mean that the algorithm is right. Like if on any one instance, the judge could be right 40% of the time, the algorithm could be right 60% of the time, but there should be a lot of instances. We have no idea in a paper like this because that will only show up at the time of deployment. So the next phase of most of this type of work has now got to be kind of, OK, what happens when you then start to deploy? Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah. We don't know. I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, I think that maybe let me just take a big step back and answer a different question, which is not the one you're answering, which is, um, can one paper solve all policy problems? No. It, like, really, as a grad student, you have to understand the scope constraint. Like, papers move the ball forward little by little by little. Like, don't, like, you know, yeah, there's tons we have no idea. I'll give you another example. You roll this out. Suppose that the judge overrules the algorithm whenever they think the algorithm is wrong. Then guess what judge plus algorithm will equal? Judge. <laughs> so there's lots of things that can go wrong. So I don't mean to imply by any stretch of the imagination. This is a scoping exercise that lets you say, wow, there's a lot of predictive power in this data that the judge is not exploiting. But what you should take seriously, therefore, is holy shit, you cannot reduce jail populations by this much without much. So you, it's almost like scoping exercises give us a sense of the potential magnitude of gains, which is why we then want to attack these things. I think you talked about sort of 
optimism versus pessimism about these things. I think you have to balance, like, why would I power my way through all of the potential problems ahead? Like, will humans adopt it? Will they do it the right way? Will we find problems with deployment? Are there racial inequities? Why would I plow my way through all of that if there isn't huge potential gains that I'm trying to get to? So in a way, a lot of this is about you scope and get the best estimate you can, like a really solid estimate, enough so that you can then go with this and say to people, hey guys, we should be trying to deploy a risk tool in a small way to see how it works. Well, no, no, let's not do that. Let's first try and put a risk tool like this in front of judges to see what they say. Why would we do any of that activity if we didn't do this? So I think that's how I almost kind of think about things like this, is kind of scope it in stages. And there are many, many stages, but papers only do small pieces of it. And, and research audiences are very comfortable with that. As long as you're not making the claim, let's roll this out tomorrow. They're very comfortable with the argument that this is what's happening. These are the things that will happen next. That's OK. So, OK. I guess on the next steps, have you looked at the distribution of the errors across, say, racial or uh, class categories? And yeah. you know, if, if you have, and if it's not you know, exactly ideal or whatever, what are the steps towards building a model that is still performing better, but also maybe not Perfect. You know, encoding? Great better. question. Yeah, so let me, let me then skip this stuff, because this is I want to get to the next thing, which is actually about, what is this? Let me actually, let me go to, OK, so I'll just end on this. I hope you guys just see that there's nothing unique about bail. There's many important prediction problems that, and predictions made by humans. I think this area is ripe because the one thing behavioral science tells us is humans are really bad at this activity. And that's why there's a chance to do much, much better. I, 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 I'm, I hate research on sports, so I hate to do this. But if you think about Moneyball, the whole point of Moneyball was that and if you think Moneyball was great that we helped baseball teams or whatever it was, was it softball? Is that what it was, softball teams? Some teams, yeah. Grown men in pajamas. Um, so the, if you think we helped those teams perform a little better, well, we, we are doing things like that in lots and lots of problems. And I'm happy to have a discussion about where other areas are. But if you take even just the welfare system, it is full of prediction problems. Like, DI, disability insurance, they're all just prediction policy problems. We make lots of decisions where we predict something about a person and then allocate a good. OK, but now to get to your point, uh, disadvantage. Actually, I'll do that third to get to disadvantage and bias. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get to say, how should we worry about in, that, in the bail algorithm? OK, so now let me talk about algorithmic analysis can reveal mechanism, because I think that's very. So to do that, I just want to just help you think about this sort of um, Facts, understanding, interventions. This is a, it's a very complex sort of slide. It's the kind of slide you make when you're very mathematically capable. No, this looks like some management consulting slide, I know. I realize that. <laughs> and uh, causal tools have been proven powerful at each stage. So let me just start with a common fact about healthcare. I'm going to do this in the healthcare space. As you all probably know, the US spends a lot of money. It's all waste. We overtreat people. And uh, we, uh, so I'll do this in an example. If someone comes into the emergency room and complains of like chest pain or some sort of respiratory problem or they're sweating, one of the things you worry about is, holy cow, are they having a heart attack? And what you would do is you would then do on them what's called a stress test or possibly catheterization to determine if they have a heart attack. A key fact about this space, which is true for stress tests but is true for most medical testing, is they have ridiculously low yields. As you probably all know, this is one of the things that's cited about how we overspend healthcare, which is we do tests that find nothing. The tests are often negative. Their average cost benefits are kind of low. And then, how do we understand it? We have a very complicated theory that says, if you pay people to do something, they do lots of it. We say, wow, big surprise. Physicians get paid to get tested. And uh, to give tests. And guess what? They do it. Okay. 
that they sure they test when they should, but they test a lot of people that they really shouldn't. They're like, do you have chest pain? Are you sure you don't have chest pain? That's the theory. It's not my I'm telling you their theory. And then we have interventions, interventions that we're trying to roll out on mass, which we say, if that's the fact, that's our understanding, here's the solution. Simply align physician incentives better. Stop paying them so stupidly. Okay? So here's how we make sense of this. And you see there's a whole pipeline. There's a mechanism. It all makes sense. It was unearthed through some combination of causal theorizing, means, some guesses of means. So now I want to go back to this problem, and I want to just think about how to do this as a machine learning problem. So I hope by now what's clear to you is the decision of who to test is exactly the bail problem. It's exactly a prediction problem. Why? You come in, you have a bunch of things I observe about you. I will now do a test on you. And the test will either find something or not find something. That's the y variable. If I don't test you, I learn nothing. What's the goal of the doctor? <laughs> to test the people that have a high yield rate and to not test the people who have a low yield rate, which is literally the same thing as the judge. Jail the people who have a high chance of fleeing, don't jail them. So, this whole problem is just a prediction problem. I want to run through the exact same bail playbook again. I just want to go through. I want to do prediction. I'm going to notice have the exact same selective label problem again. It's all just going to show up. But let's just do it again, because this time I'm going to do it with the eye towards telling you that machine learning run back through this exact playbook is going to give us a new fact. It's going to give us a new sort of understanding. It'll suggest some potential interventions. So of course, it could never test them, because that's a causal thing. So what would this look like? Let's start with the things. I'll skip all this. Patients with symptoms and so on, so speed this up. So because now that you've seen the Bell playbook, I was going to go through this at some length, but I don't think it's worth it. So I'm just going to literally run a big ML thing on all of the data, on all of the patients who come in. And I can just show you what we find. Where is this? Let's just go to here. So here's the fact. Now what do I have? I have all a prediction of yield for everybody. So if we go back to the original argument, the original argument was, wow, we test people of low average yield. But that's actually a very weird way to quantify physicians doing badly. Imagine the average yield was, was pretty, pretty high. They could still, at the margin, be testing a lot of zero yield people. They just happen to have a lot of high yield people, and it washes out. So let's look deeper and actually look at the distribution of yield and understand the marginal yields. Does that make sense to everybody? So even in the original theoretical testing, you see that this whole literature would have looked different if you had a machine learning approach, because instead of citing a fact of low average yield, they could have shown the yield distribution amongst the tested. So when you look at the tested, this is the yield distribution. So I organize by predicted risk here. This is the lowest risk, the highest risk. What's shocking is the average yield is about 17.4%. The lowest yield here is nearly one point, it's about one tenth of the average. We thought this was a low number. These people almost have no chance at all. And we've actually done this on a, on a bigger data set. And I've never seen numbers as close to zero on the bigger data sets. You actually literally get 5% of the population that has never a chance, even in this huge holdout set, of seeing anything. So the problem is much more severe in over-testing than you think. To do this in cost-benefit terms, I don't know what happened here. Oh, that's me, I think. Here. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. If I do a cost-benefit calculation, the bottom 40% of tests are about $578,000 per life year. As economists, we really enjoy putting life in dollar terms. It gives us a some sort of gut visceral feel. So I'll just enjoy the slide for a minute. Now, this is not economics. This is like how health policy in the US works. There is actually a dollar figure for your life. And also, you're cheaper whenever you're in Europe. Just think about that for a minute. Yet you really are. You're much cheaper when you're in Europe. Do you guys know this? It's wild. Yeah, even your arms are worth less. Um, so the average was about 281. The bottom 40 is 578. So this just gives you a sense of the marginal yield. So I don't want to get into this too much. This is like the beginning of it. 
What I want to get to is, first, overtesting is much more severe than the average is revealed. That's not really a, a win for mechanism. It just says, great, the mechanism we already have in mind is more extreme. Here's the win for, oh yeah, this one I said. The bottom 20% is at $890,000 per life year. It's less effective than uh, automated colonoscopy of every, you know, everybody over a certain age, which people think is a ridiculous idea. Okay, so that's not what I'm interested in. You can imagine where I'm headed. There are all these people who have ridiculously high rates of discovery. That's fine. There's some very high risk people. We know there's high risk people, and we're testing them. No, we're not. Only 17% of people in this cell are being tested. So, do we have a problem of under testing, or do we have a problem? Do we have a problem of over testing, or a problem of under testing? And now you can see where the selective labels problem really kicks in. I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't test them. We don't have labels on these people. It's a crazy idea. So, I'm going to skip how we solve the selective labels problem because there are two tricks, and they're going to be similar to what you've seen. One is. Guess who else has very differences in testing rates? Doctors have huge differences in testing rates. The second trick is, unlike in bail, actually, I'll show you the other one, because the other one is crazy. Unlike in bail, we, um, sorry, we do measure something about these people, which is, they go home, and other shit happens to them. So we can actually measure not the test result, but what happens to them once they're sent home. And um, it's not good news. I don't know if you guys uh, like stories with unhappy endings, but um, these people, the high-risk people who are untested, who are sent home, go on to have heart attacks in the next 180 days at home, come back again with a heart attack. This is with any sort of positive troponin test, which is a test for a heart attack. What's striking in the medical literature, a 0.1, greater than 0.1 is a pretty severe heart attack. 8% of them go on to come back with a very, 2% come back with an insanely severe heart attack. These are crazy levels. What's worse is that um, their mortality is about 16% in the next uh, year and their chance of cardiac arrest is about four times the base rate in that group. So we don't have the label. We're going to use the doctor stuff to do it. But in this thing, you can start to triangulate and say, it really looks like physicians are making a mistake. They're not just over-testing. They're ridiculously under-testing. I can show you what happens with the same thing as the selective labels. Um, we do both physician variation. Yeah, here's the other thing we did, which is kind of funny. This is why, it's, maybe, so I, so I put this in here. We use variation in, um, when you show up in overnights. In overnights, there's only one emergency room doctor. And that doctor, who, whether you showed up on a particular night with a heavy tester, like my co-author on this, Ziad Obermeyer, he just tests everybody, um, uh, or with a doctor who's very stingy, makes a big difference. And so what you find is that, I'll skip all this. So I'm just going to rerun exactly the bail playbook, and you find exactly that. Physicians are ridiculously under-testing. There are a ton of high-risk people that are left untested that we could just repopulate the entire testing pool with just a high risk and still not deplete them. So what this tells you, I hope you see, is that even though all I did was just run the standard bail playbook, now I'm not going to say, oh, let's put decision aids in front of doctors. Instead, I'm going to say, Let's stop thinking about the problem of healthcare in the United States as over-testing by doctors and overuse. It's not a problem of low average yield. It's a problem of misallocation of resources. And if it's a problem of misallocation of resources, it can't be just that it's physicians having incentives to do more. It's something else. And so here, what you can tend to do is you can then start to use the algorithm to isolate behavioral mechanisms. So this goes back to your question about predicting judges. Here, we have a much richer data set because we see everything about the patient. And then we start to predict the physician behavior and ask, when does the physician test? And compare and ask, who are the groups that are over and under tested? What's fascinating, I learned a lot from this thing, that first, what you find is this is reverse engineering. So I'll tell you, like, 
the explanation from the fact. So one fact is, take something like pneumonia. The symptoms of pneumonia are cough, shortness of breath. And if you just map the symptoms of pneumonia, patients who are diagnosed with pneumonia, what are their common complaints? Put them up against heart attack, common complaints. Pneumonia shares a lot of things. So you can see where this is headed. If you're a patient who has had pneumonia, it's easy for a physician to say, oh, I know what that is. That's pneumonia, and send you home. So in fact, what we find is for when doctors think you have pneumonia, they, they're much less likely to test you at every risk level. So if you're a high-risk person, no pneumonia, 18% tested. Pneumonia, only 6% tested. It's like Occam's razor, except it's a blunder, because it turns out that, I don't know if you know this, but you can have two diseases at the same time. <laughs> so a bunch of the misses are the people who have pneumonia and are high risk, or who have symptoms, or the doctor decides they have pneumonia and are high risk. So that's fact one. And you find this not just with pneumonia, but with a thing called COPD. I'll skip this. So we call this Occam's blunder. It's not like Occam's razor. The second thing is, um, let's talk about racial bias. You could say you're a white male who's 71 years old, and that might indicate your base rates. What's awesome about physicians is that I was shocked at this. This is average yield, average test rate by a bunch of demographic groups. Physicians actually get it quite right. Their average test rates correlate pretty well with the base rate of each group. In other words, they test white, old white males more than young um, uh, white females, old black males more than young Hispanic females. You know, they get kind of the rankings quite right. But what this graph doesn't show is where the over and under testing appears. So if these are all the demographic groups oriented left to right, low to high risk, any guesses where the under testing is? Yeah, or in this. Yeah. It turns out the underprivilege doesn't work that well. It's exactly just the base rate. So if you have low risk, your group has low risk, but you happen to be high risk, you're much less likely to be tested. If you're high risk, but you have, you're from a high risk group, but you happen to have low risk, you're much more likely to be tested. So the over testing is all here in the high yield groups, and the low under-testing is all in the low yield groups. So if you build an algorithm to predict risk just using demographics, that's a pretty good predictor of what the, what the, what the doctor is doing, and all their errors are, are off of that. So it's not a sort of a disadvantage theory. It's a pure stereotypes, base rates theory. So that's just, I'll skip all this. I'm just telling you this because I think, notice, I feel like mechanistically we've understood this a little better, and now the algorithm is actually giving us some insight into the nature of the cognitive error. Now let me conclude and argue that even the machine learning approach can give you insight into what the interventions might be. One obvious insight is decision aids. But let me give you an insight before that. Let's start with the incentives we use right now. Remember I told you the current understanding is that we obviously overtest because we, um, we have incentives to do less testing. So guess what we should do? We should reduce incentives. And we've kind of done that. And here's what the problem with that is. I shall show you a, a funny figure more than that. This is Boston hospitals. This is Boise hospitals by region. In the health literature, we make these comparisons and say these hospital chains are awesome because they're the cost control hospital chains. They've got lots of incentives in place to reduce testing. They're kind of lauded as the chains that everyone should become like. These are the out of control hospitals. And in fact, in our data, you find Boise tests less than Boston. Great. Here's the problem. This is by, test, this is by predicted risk. Good news, Boise tests much less of the low risk. Bad news, Boise tests a lot less of the high risk. Boise just tests less of everybody. So this tells you off the bat, 
every incentive mechanism we've been trying to deploy on this stuff is weirdly broken because it's not an incentive for what we want it to be an incentive for. And there's nothing that the person at the margin, when the physician naturally says, let me test less, their natural intuition is not oriented left to right on this. Whatever it's oriented on, it's largely just unrelated to risk. So if I were to conclude, I'd say, and you find this all across, so I'd say, hope I've given you a sense that mechanistically, there's a lot to be understood, and these algorithms can actually, and so my hope is papers like this, what's the impact of this? It is mechanism, I think. It's to say, wow, we need new models in health policy and health economics, which are not models that rely on incentive misalignment, but models that really focus on actual misallocation and decision making. So does that make sense to everybody? Any questions about this? Because this is what I took away from this whole paper and was designed to do was to say, if we're just careful in picking our Y hat problems, like here, I picked a testing problem, not with the view towards building a decision aid, but with the view towards understanding a thing under testing, over testing. I tried to pick a prediction problem, predict what the doctor will do to try to understand the behavioral bias. But just by stringing them together, I feel like we made some headway towards understanding the nature of a structural systemic problem, which I, at least going in, I had felt like, I'll skip this, I had felt like might be, oh, what is wrong here? Oh, which I felt uh, that careful algorithmic analysis can reveal mechanism. Any questions about this one? Because then I can get to the uh, reduced disadvantage and bias stuff. Disadvantage? Should we do it? Bias? All right, here we go. So I just want to have a starting point in my understanding of this, which might, I hope all of you share, but it shall just tell you where I'm coming from. My starting point for the algorithmic bias literature is that I know of one algorithm that's very biased and discriminatory against all sorts of groups, which is the one sitting inside each of our heads. It's built for bias. And there are tons of studies that show this. How many of you have seen this study? I just want to show because I love this. It's good, right? It's OK. You've all seen this. If you've not seen this, they basically put up iPods for auction. And they have no difference in the ads, except this is one kind of ad, this is another kind, this is another kind of ad. And you'll see the subtle difference. White person, white person with tattoos for reasons I don't quite understand. No, 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 they have, they have a reason, elaborate reason, as far as I can tell. I still put 10% odds, it's just that one of their RAs had tattoos, but nevertheless. White person, white person with tattoos, African American. It's the only difference in the ads. And then what you find is, even though it's the same iPod, same everything, 3.8% chance that this iPod gets sold and shipped, 3% chance that it's sold and it gets shipped by this person, don't get a tattoo on your, on your wrist or cover it up when selling iPods, much more tragically, 1.6% chance. So this is by way of saying, you can't pin this on the algorithm. <laughs> Human bias is inherently, insanely rampant. And because that's my starting point, I think I'm very sympathetic, more than sympathetic to the idea that algorithms can inherit this bias because they're trained on data created by humans. But I don't want to lose facts that we're deriving this algorithmic bias from this point. We're deriving this from the human bias being rampant. So what I want to do is, in these prediction policy problems that I've told, talked about, so now we're going to go back to judges, I want to understand how can algorithms bias or worsen bias. So I feel like there are four lessons here. I'll try to go through them fairly quickly. The first is that we have to be careful in what we mean by performance. The typical playbook is you just run an algorithm, you predict why, you evaluate performance. That's what I did here. I said, oh, look, I can reduce jail populations by 41%. If I stop there, I will have left out a very important feature of performance, which is how does this affect different groups differently? OK. How many of you think that this, you know, if we replace this judge with this algorithm, reduce jail populations by 41%, that would be good. That, that, I haven't shown you the data yet, but that, that could potentially be bad for African American or Hispanic defendants. That's it? How many think it could be potentially good? Oh, you guys want to go both directions? Yeah. 
And the rest of you have no opinion on this matter? Really? You're not afraid that it might be good or bad? No one's willing to say, uh, just by showing you this, I'm willing to tell you off the bat, there's a reason you should think it's going to be really good. There's a reason you should think that if you're an Af yeah. Right, so one reason is machines don't have the biases we have. That's right. There's another thing in this figure that should make you think off the bat. Like, it's not subtle. It's a huge effect. You're releasing a lot of people. If you believe, as you should, that the jail systems are disproportionately African American, and I said I can empty 41% of jail populations, you know who that benefits? The math is trivial. So off the bat, you should be very wary of these calculations where people say, amongst the released, I did these calcul. OK, first just tell me the level effect. Because you cannot do the utilitarian calculation without doing the level effect. And the effect is huge. It's 41%. In fact, it turns out at the margin, it's releasing people roughly equal. The 41% are coming pretty much equally from every group. So what's left behind matches whatever the distribution was. That's what you find. The detention rates left over are 19, 14, and 17%, which is not too far from what it was before if the algorithm matches the judge at the crime rate. Is this good or bad? What disparity should we accept? I just want you to remember, don't forget the absolute effect. In the entire algorithmic fairness literature, we often focus on the fairness of the predictor in some fixed set. OK, on this part. But that never takes into account the level effect. The only reason we're deploying these predictors is because there's a level effect. So you cannot consider this absent the level effect. Does that make sense to everybody? So first observation, level effect. Absolute gains versus relative gains. You can have enormous social welfare gains even if your predictor ridiculously violates statistical parity. Who cares? 41% of people off the bat. I'm not saying you should. I'm just saying don't ignore that. In these applications, that's actually the big number. Lesson two, you have to distinguish disadvantage from bias. If the algorithm is violating this parity, is it doing so because of disadvantage, because those groups have, lower, have higher rates, or because the algorithm is biased? Does that distinction make sense to everybody? It's a difference between the why being different between these groups and the error being different. So here's what I want to show you. I'm now going to go down on the curve. I'm going to hold constant the release rate at the usual ranking rule. That way, there isn't a 41% gain, because we're just jailing the same number of people. And then I'm going to observe that we jail about, the algorithm jails about 32.3% of African Americans, 24% of Hispanics, about 29% of the minority group, and achieves a 24.68% thing. Now, what I want to observe is that this is a slightly misleading number to report, because you've trained an algorithm and told it, I want you to predict this thing. We're going to just equalize whatever. And then you're evaluating it on racial distributions. What you really need to know is, if you care about the equity, then just equalize. So you should ask, great, don't release according to that rule. Let's do equal release rates for all groups. So let's achieve the same release rate the, that the judge got, but force release at equal rates for all groups. What's shocking here for me is when we do that, remember I told you there was a 24.68% gain? When I equalize release rates, I get about the same gain. At the margin, there were a lot of people, and we could have gotten any racial composition we wanted. So this is by way of saying we absolutely need to take these effects into account. Otherwise, we wouldn't realize, wow, you mean there's almost no efficiency difference between these two rules. Obviously, we have huge social preference differences between one that has a 32% for African Americans and one that has 26.39% for African Americans. So this is where I walk away thinking there's potentially a huge gain, because this is what the judge produces. This is what the algorithm produces. So even if we don't take into account my 
disparate benefit of releasing a lot of people and I jail the same number of people. This is to the earlier point that, I don't remember which one of you said it, the judge is biased. You were saying this. The algorithm is not. We can have it find a whole set of African Americans that have basically the same amount of risk and produce the same amount of crime. So that is the third lesson I take away from this. Because humans are biased and algorithms are biased, but less so, we can actually achieve a huge amount of gains in this space. And more importantly, algorithms let us control the trade-off. We have now an ability to do something that we never could before, which is to say, if we care about certain types of equity across certain groups, we can put thresholds anywhere we want and form any number we want and, in fact, produce the efficiency equity trade-off and know where we want to sit on it. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So um, that's the right benchmark. That's what I was going to say there. Now let me move to the next thing. And then I will stop after this one, because I think we're running out of time. Everything I just did is based on one big assumption, which is there's an outcome variable that we're predicting, and that's what we care about. Once you have that, we're good to go. But I think people focus on racial bias in the predictor. Is it unfair? Is it disadvantaged? They worry far too little about the outcome that's being predicted itself. I hope what I've convinced you is the function itself is not going to screw you up. Now I want to show you a different set of results that will argue to you that the outcome being predicted is where a lot of the bias is going to come from. Okay? So this is, again, in healthcare. Uh, this is from an area where, again, because we're trying to reduce costs, hospitals seek to improve efficiency of care. So they try to identify these high-cost patients. And they enroll or sick patients. So basically the idea is, if you're going to have diabetes and you have some heart condition, there's a chance you'll have lots of little problems. And if you went to the ER each time, that's very expensive for the system. So if you're going to be that type of patient, we should give you a nurse whose number you can call. It's basically like a concierge system for frequent flyers. So it's like a special number they get to call, and then they get them. People have found that these type of programs help in cost and quality because it help, you can get them before their health deteriorates, you get them. So ACOs start trying to implement these programs. These are accountable care organizations. And they want to use an algorithm, though, to decide who to target this program to. Okay? It turns out that there are some commercial algorithms that you can buy that then target the program that predict things. So I will show you the results of such algorithms. Here is the risk score of this algorithm. Here is the cost, realized cost the following year of the patients based on their risk score for black patients and white patients. So if you look at it, there's a very tiny gap in these curves. But if anything, that gap doesn't suggest discrimination against African Americans. It's the reverse. Why? Given a high risk score, actually whites are even more risky than they seem. The thing you fear is if this is inverted, it means at the same risk level, the person is less likely to get into the program. Does that make sense to everybody? So here what we're seeing is roughly the same. So you might conclude from this, wow, this is pretty good. The algorithm predicts cost, costs are balanced. Not much bias. But there's a problem. And you start to see the problem when you start to break down the costs. Because costs in healthcare come in two kinds of costs. Emergency room visits, and let's say outpatient. I've left inpatient out of here, but it does the same thing. Here, you're like, wow, now there's an even bigger gap. At every risk level, whites have more outpatient costs. But you combine this with the previous one, and you realize there's about to be a pretty big problem. For emergency visits, African Americans have a much higher cost. But who cares? Do I care? I think I do care. Because costs are outpatient plus ER, but these costs are not equal. I don't care about all costs. I care about reducing costs, which means preventable costs. I started by telling you that the program was aimed at reducing emergency room costs. So I don't want the predictable costs. I want the kind of costs that are preventable and modifiable. So I kind of wanted just this cost. And I've kind of shown you now the program is not being targeted well at all 
because we should be produce, predicting emergency room costs and targeting that, but we're predicting all costs and targeting that. And for emergency rooms, there's a huge gap. So the African Americans who can be both helped by the program are actually not being put in the program. This is so subtle. How does this, how does this happen? This happens because when people talk about what needs to be predicted, we talk in semantically meaningful concepts. We say, oh, predict costs. No healthcare professional was thinking, predict all costs. They're like, I just told you the whole story. It's about these sort of emergency room costs. Why didn't you predict that? But of course, no human's going to be confused, but the algorithm is. And this is an error that shows up in all these problems. You have a well-defined prediction policy problem. We want to allocate people with high expected costs. But when it comes to the last little bit, exactly how do we define this thing, it, everything goes haywire. It happens in all of these areas. And that's because we're just not used to this fine-tooth activity. Algorithms predict specific variables in these kind of translation problems around. But I just want to point out something else. This is not just a translation problem. Even once we predict ER costs, there's another problem. Sure, the hospital is focused on costs, but society doesn't care about costs. It cares about health. So if we look at that, things get much worse. On, based on predicted risk, and even if you predict emergency room costs here, what do you find? At every risk level, African Americans are much sicker, which means, quite problematically, if you drew a threshold like here, you should admit this far down in the distribution before you admit any of the white patients, but in fact, you're admitting a lot of white patients. A lot of less sick, this is for uh, HbA1c, which is a marker for diabetes. This is for high blood pressure. This is for uh, mean BMI. This is for, I'm not even trying to say that, this is for anemia. This is the Gagne sum, which is the sum of all comorbidities in this big risk indicator. At every level, African Americans are much sicker than the things. So even if the hospital is comfortable with costs and they're locally optimizing, from a policy point of view, this is very problematic. There's an externality that's been created. Because you, the, the, doctor is getting, the hospital is getting better at predicting costs, but society cares about health, and improving Y prediction is actually exaggerating Y minus W, cost minus health. And this happens everywhere. We might have police departments that care about arrests, but society cares about true crimes. By getting better and better at predicting arrests, we're actually doing worse at the outcome brings. We might have education systems that care about test scores, but we actually care about true knowledge. So there is an element in which prediction could potentially make things much worse, but it's an element you should all be familiar with. It was like the pay for performance element. It's like paying for A while hoping for B. But this is kind of the prediction externality makes that problem much worse. We have agents choosing on Y, and algorithms optimizing Y, but society caring about W. You see this with search results optimized for click-through. No one is saying that the search engine is doing wrong, but by getting better and better at optimizing click-through, we could be exaggerating some of this. Um, I'll skip this one. So I'll end on this one, because this is quite easy. Um, I want to end by saying the last thing that I think is important to think about in this literature is that familiar correctives for bias can backfire. Do you all know this study on orchestras? This is like you put, so this is probably the most familiar corrective in the discrimination literature. When we tend to uh, make sure that you can't see the gender of the person or the race of the person, things improve. I'm now going to show you results from admissions where we predicted whether a student will do badly and we built three kinds of algorithms. We excluded race, so it's like blinding the screen. We went further and say, Maybe the algorithm can peek around and rediscover race by looking at all the other variables, so we blinded the algorithm to race. Or we built this very complicated algorithm where we ignored all of this. And then what I did was, I'm now going to show you, this is the percentage of admits that are African American, ranked just like in Bale according to, again, performance, for a given admission rate. So this is like me controlling the racial composition. This is the percentage of, therefore, the admitted pool who did not receive, um, who, who failed out. So this is bad. What you'll notice is this is the performance of the entirely, um, let me make sure I get this right, um, 
This is the race blind algorithm. This is the algorithm where we tried to orthogonalize. This is the algorithm where we did nothing. You'll notice a problem here. At every single level, the algorithm that knows race, that doesn't, doesn't do any of this hiding business, actually does much, 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 much better. How is that possible? This is the exact opposite of what you see with orchestras. It's possible because of something that you should be very familiar with. If I told you we have two kids who both scored 13-10 on the SAT, one of whom comes from a well-off family, maybe received coaching, the other comes from a poor family, which one do you think knows the material better? This goes without saying, when you live in an environment with lots of bias, exactly because the data is biased, you need the race variable and the socioeconomic status variable. That's what this figure is telling you, and it's a pretty general result. The inclusion of these variables actually helps the disadvantaged groups, not the other way around. And it's a mechanical result, but somehow we forget this. So this is just by way of saying, I'll skip this general result, and I'll say, Algorithmic bias needs sort of a different legal and regulatory framework. You can see things like disparate treatment no longer apply. So I'm just going to end on this slide. So for racial bias, I'd say we went from saying these algorithms are great to saying, uh oh, they have lots of bias, things are bad, to I hope we now are entering wave three, which is why I started by saying let's not forget the scoping exercise, which is if we pick the right problems and apply them carefully, there's actually an enormous amount of gains that can be had for these low-income groups. And I think that's the wave three that we're heading towards. It's not to say anything we did in this wave is wrong. It's saying we have to be attuned to this, and now we have to kind of get there. And so I hope my conclusion is the following. I feel like I've seen two big um, changes in my discipline, which is behavioral economics and randomized control trials. And I have to say that both these innovations had a similar diffusion structure, and I'm starting to see the same thing with machine learning. In the beginning, there is an inordinate amount of talk about how something is not possible, you won't be able to do this, okay, if you did that, then what? In the beginning, there's an inordinate amount of discussion about how is this science, how is this economics, how is this whatever. But once you start just writing concrete papers to do something from end to end, somehow all those criticisms are largely forgotten. People just are like, oh, that is interesting. So I think the same thing is happening in machine learning, which is I hope that you guys recognize the criticisms, imbibe them, have answers to them, but that it doesn't in any way prevent you from working on the interesting questions, that you view them as challenges to be overcome. Because if these two things are any indication, actually the returns are insanely high because one reason people are making all these statements is because they're interested. They actually want to see work in these areas, and that's why there's so much discussion of them. It's not that they don't want to see work. Okay, so let me stop there. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, uh, we've been playing by economist rules, so I don't know if there's still more questions. We, could, we have time for about one more. Otherwise, let's, oh, yeah, we got one right here. Oh, so thank you very, for a very interesting talk. And if possible, I'd please ask you to share the slides with us yeah. uh, at your convenience. Uh, so actually, I mean, regarding your results, I think, on average, judges, doctors, insurance companies, and many other powerful groups might not be so happy with your results. And that's something I congratulate you for. But this <laughs> means at the same time, it would make it maybe harder to transform these numbers into action. So my, my question is, how fast do you, do you see a change would start to happen, even slightly because of such uh, studies, and the related one, what are the low-hanging fruits where certain topics, this change might be faster? So uh, quickly on the first one, kind of counterintuitively, I hope the change comes slowly because I, I think that <clears throat> I also have a little bit of cynicism, but by and large, I think I've come to accept there's a lot of functionality to resistance. I think the reason... And this goes back to the question earlier about adoption and will, will judges kind of, you know, what will they get? I think that these are scoping exercises. So now it's good if people realize we now need a set of deployment tests and they go one by one by one 
and it's good that everything is forced to pass through these hurdles. I actually, given the stakes are so high, I would actually feel much better if the system looked closer to a drug trial, where the first thing is not deployment with real people. Let's not do that. Let's first go and do user testing with the judge and ask, what did you see in these cases? Now, once we've got that, like, let's deploy slowly and deliberately, et cetera. So, and I actually have found in all these cases that um, my, my unease has been too fast deployment. So jurisdictions have started using pretrial risk tools. I'm like, wait, you didn't even do minimum amount of testing. This is madness. We don't even know if this tool is good. There are pretrial risk tools that are deployed off of terrible testing in holdout sets that doesn't even take into account selective labels. So I actually, on the first one, I'm very optimistic that in a 10-year horizon, things will change. And here's why I'm very optimistic, or 20 years. When you guys fly home, if there, if the plane, when the plane is landing, you look outside, there's a lot of uh, storm clouds. And the pilot says, it's going to be a very bumpy landing. There's very hard crosswinds. Um, Luckily, there's an autopilot built exactly for this. And since I believe in democracy, I'm going to ask you guys, should I use the autopilot or should I land it on my own? I, the trained human expert. How many of you would say, I want you to do it? Exactly. That's the point. We have all come to accept all sorts of algorithms, all sorts of places, in all sorts of situations. It's with testing and careful building there's not going to be any inherent resistance to this stuff. You, we adopt algorithms for all sorts of stuff, but we have built-in buffers that we should have. I would say for you guys, I would give a different kind of advice, though, as to where to go. Like I said earlier, as a grad student, if, you know, or as a junior faculty member, you don't want your work to consist of until this algorithm gets across the finish line of deployment. <laughs> it's just too long. It's also too many different kinds of skills. The skills needed to do the work over here are different than the skills needed to do the work over here. So I would almost imagine this pipeline of deployment. Do it, finding archival data sets that have interesting prediction policy problems and running machine learning on them in a way to solve selective labels. That is quantitative applied microeconomics type work with some causal inference flavor. That's cool. People who have that, I think there's so much to be done there. Pilot testing, user testing of that with experts being able to understand, that's an amazing kind of qualitative work, including qualitative work on how did these jurisdictions who bought these risk tools decide to buy them? There's an enormous amount of qualitative research to be done around the adoption, not even necessarily the whether people will believe them, just how did they even decide to buy them? Who sells them? What does that market look like? So there's that qualitative work. There's the contextualization. So if I imagine each of the pipeline, there's so much room for different people to plug in and whole careers to be made. There's just going to be a ton of people who become famous for really understanding the problems of procuring these algorithms. Just that. Even the qualitative research on that is just by itself going to be a great you know, portfolio of work. So I might almost just think not this way for purposes of imagining I want to do the whole thing, but to say, how can I slide in on one of these slices? Does that make sense? And so that's where I would look for on any of these pieces. So thank you. <laughs>